So today we'll talk about documentation as you see it at eight, at Tate, sorry. Uh, uh, Osman kindly invited us to talk about the chapter we wrote for the book Conservation of Time-Based Media Art. And with this talk, uh, we translated that chapter into three examples from our three different perspectives. Uh, Anna will discuss the acquisition and first display of a performance work, uh, Liming Ways Our Labyrinth. Francesca will talk about the documentation she used and created for the Steve McQueen show at Tate Modern in 2020. And you will hear from me again about Work Soul, a software-based sculpture by Donald Rawlton that we are acquiring and intervening to future-proof uh, as we speak. Just as brief intro, so this is the book and our chapter is the one under the pink arrow. Um, and the book tries to cover or give a new overview of current practices in museums and collections. And in Angle and Joanna, we're able to gather a wide range uh, a wide ranging group of authors and experts in their fields and very engaged in day to day work in the areas that they write about. And it addresses issues from how to start with time based media art conservation in an institution through to what you need to build a workplace and then both cross medium and medium specific practices of conservation. Um, and then I'll, um, <clears throat> sorry, and uh, I think that's all you need to understand of about where this talk is coming from and that it does come very, very closely from our practice. And of course, essential to our practice, oh, sorry, Anna, can you change the slide? Um, essential to our practice is our the team we work with. Um, and you can see we're quite unusual in that the team started in 1998 with Pip Lawrenson. So we have a long history now of um, establishing and developing our practices. Um, and there's a lot of us compared to most other uh, conservation, time-based media conservation departments that I'm aware of. So we have eight conservators, two assistant conservators and six senior conservation technicians, um, which is huge. What is the reason we need such big team as well is that, you know, we handle acquisitions of new artworks into the collection, but we're also responsible for displays and installing artworks in the galleries. And we also have a, a program area of loans where we prepare artworks to be shown in other institutions. Um, and underlying all of this is of course, the collection care duties that deal with maintaining artworks beyond these program areas and learning about other technologies, uh, but also research areas to allow us to care for the new kinds of technologies that come into the collection fairly regularly. Um, besides the, the core staff team, and maybe this is the wrong term because some of our um, freelancers have been with us longer than um, actually, yes, they, they've been very uh, with us for a very long time. Uh, but so we have this pool of, of expert freelancers that <clears throat> are very familiar with Tate and with conservation practice. And further to this, of course, we are a very well-funded public institution with the UK that has at its core the need to care for a collection that is considered of national value. So that gives us a support that it's pretty unique, I would say. Um, so this is so you understand our context. And next I will just explain briefly how we look, how we structure the chapter and how we think about documentation from a very practical perspective in the collection, uh, which is through the life of the work in the collection. Uh, and by the time we come into this process, it's usually when an artwork is being acquired or considered for acquisition to take, uh, and that there's this first step of pre-acquisition where we uh, try to understand what the work is even before it comes in so we can have discussions with an artist ab about what we are acquiring, what is coming to our care. Um, and then once the work is in the, uh, in the collection, there's all these other processes that happen related to displaying the work and lending it to other institutions. Um, and of course, there's also the aspect of intervention. So we often have to act on, uh, interve intervene in artworks to make sure they're, um, they keep functioning basically. <laughs> um, and so, and, I think this is the essential part. So our um, documentation happens a lot around this point, which is not necessary because they are the moments where we learn more about the work. Uh, 
and then I guess just to give you a sense of the types of works we are talking about, I'll just move to, so we, we classify them from simple to very complex. These are just a few examples of, of the variability. The examples we are going to talk about for this presentation are the very complex kind for all of us. Um, sorry, for multiple reasons. So in our, um, and I will, I think all of us will mention why our, our case studies are so specific. Uh, but just so you understand, there, these are the very complex examples. And what you see here is sort of contained artworks with video in one monitor or uh, projection, video projections that are, are quite complex in the space, but maybe in terms of preservation are, are less complex <laughs> or, or not. So I will let Anna speak, uh, go on now. Anna, you're muted. Oh, sorry, Fran, can you share now, <laughs> if you don't mind? Okay, so um, as Patricia has said in the beginning of, of um, the presentation, um, oh, it's not sharing, I think. Um, but yeah, I can, I can, I can start um, uh, a little bit. So as Patricia mentioned before, um, I'll be, um, I'll be speaking to um, a case of uh, documenting um, a performance um, uh, at Tate, a performance that is part of uh, Tate's collection. Um, so lately, I have been focusing a lot on uh, performance-based artworks. Uh, Fran, can you put on the, the slide before? Thank you. Um, yeah, so lately I have been focusing a lot on um, performance-based artworks. Uh, and I wanted to bring here the most recent experience of activating a performance at Tate. Uh, this is our labyrinth by um, the artist Li Mingwe. So through this example, I want to talk about the three stages uh, that we consider uh, when activating and documenting such work that is part of, of the collection. Um, so the first step, we consider the pre-activation. So this is the preparation um, of the documentation and the preparation of the activation work. Uh, can you go back? Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Brian. Um, and then there's the second stage, which is the, the activation. Uh, so this is where the documentation work happens and also, uh, you know, when when we support um, uh, the, the activation uh, and includes work such as um, interviews to the artists and the performers and then the post activation, uh, which is when we process all the documentation that we develop during the activation. Um, uh, process and includes, you know, processing interview data, uh, visualizing footage or editing footage. Uh, can you change now, Fran? Thank you. Uh, so just before we focus on our labyrinth, I would like to give you a quick overview um, of work we develop uh, from an acquisition stage going into the performance's first activation. So at the point of acquisition, we start gathering information that helps us uh, starting to develop tools such, um, you know, um, the activation history of the work, uh, performance specification. And at this point, and after analyzing the information we receive from artists, such as guidelines uh, to perform an an artwork or video documentation we may have um, we may have questions and we normally develop interviews or conversations with artists um, these might just be the beginning uh, um, 
and an artwork may be in storage for a while before it gets to be displayed after being uh, acquired. Um, but the first activation after acquisition is when we might experience the work for the first time since we start working on, on, on it. So this is a key time to further our understanding of the work and uh, also remove any assumptions that we may have developed. Can we, uh, can I have the next slide, Fran? Thank you. Uh, so coming back to our labyrinth, first I want to briefly describe you the, the work. So, um, so our labyrinth has joined the Tate collection in 2020, and it was conse uh, conse uh, consequently activated at Tate Modern for the first time during a period of three weeks between May and June 2023. Our labyrinth is described as a participatory performance in which single dancers dressed in floor length sarongs and wearing ankle bells take it in turns to sweep a mound of rice in patterns on the floor in a designated gallery space for about an hour and a half. Uh, the dancers are instructed uh, to move very slowly and to listen to the rice. This movement is not choreographed and as dancers are being led by the mound of rice. Um, as described on Tate's website page about our labyrinth, the work was inspired by um, the artist's visit to Myanmar in 2014, where he noticed when visiting places of worship, visitors are required to remove their shoes and that these spaces were constantly being maintained by volunteers, sweeping the floors with brooms. This costume is described by the artist as not only a form of meditation, but as a gift to the community. Therefore, our labyrinth takes place constantly over a period of around 21 days to suggest the commitment with which temple sweepers apply themselves to the task. The act of sweeping is intended as a gift from the dancers to the visitors and an exploration of relationship between spirituality and architectural space. Um, so each perform uh, performance activation involves at least one seed dancer, who is a dancer that has performed the piece, the piece before and carried embodied knowledge, who also has a supporting role in facilitating the performance to new dancers, finding the piece for the first time. Um, it is important to say that at Tate Modern last year, even the work was being displayed at the Turbine Hall, it was expanded to accommodate two dancers performing at once, instead of just one. Um, the preparation and documentation work we developed for our labyrinth was focused on developing an understanding around the transmission of embodied knowledge between the dancers. This was inspired uh, by the work we had developed uh, for the Reshaping the Collectible uh, Research Project case study, 10 Years Alive on the Infinite Plane by Tony Conrad. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so during the preparation um, work we developed, my colleagues Louise Lawson, Yasu and myself got familiarized with the work and identified key aspects that needed to be developed uh, and documented, such as uh, developing interview questions and identify who we are interviewing. Um, um, part, uh, uh, being present during auditions, rehearsal, moments of transmission, how to use the props, etc., and methods to record these key aspects. Um, so with identifying methods such as video, audio, note-taking, uh, photography. Next slide, please. Um, so to help us identify the key aspects to document the piece, we first mapped the performance and planned the activation. Uh, this is a method we learned in conversation with Motion Bank in, in Germany, and we went to identifying different aspects of an artwork like the installation period, rehearsal period, performance, interviews, post-performance, and describe the different documentation needs, resources, uh, and who is doing what. Um, next slide, please. Um, the, the transmission. Uh, and embodied knowledge was still an important 
important part of, of the work that we were developed during the activation. Uh, but what we noticed was that the process of the activation became very apparent through rehearsals, the performances, the feedback sections that were developed uh, by visiting the green room periodically, etc. cetera. Um, and, you know, by seeing this uh, process developing, we could was we could ask what is working well, what is not working, and why. So, if if one of the main ideas that we are developing uh, around these artworks is supporting a system of or communities linked to these kinds of artworks, mainly coming from ten years alive on the infinite plane, case study conclusions then we need to stop focusing only on the artists and the performance voices solely. I think this is especially true for artworks that involve improvisation practices. Um, what is supporting the artists and the performers? Is, it's, it's one of our questions. Uh, there is this activation process happening that is dependent in many other people. Uh, this is something that became apparent to us while being there, getting to know different people, seeing them in action. Uh, we decided to expand, at this point, we decided to expand the interviews we had planned during the preparation to include not only the artists and the performers, but also the Lee studio managers and Tate curatorial and, and production teams. Uh, next slide, please. Um, at this moment, uh, so this happened, the activation happened in 2022. Sorry, I think I had mentioned 2023, but no, I, I confused myself uh, before. Uh, so at this moment, we are now in the last phase we, where we are pro processing all the data that we have gathered during the activation. Uh, there is a lot to go through. So this happened in May, June, and we are in 2023, and we're still going through it. So this basically means listening and reading all the interviews that were developed. Uh, we are developing interview summaries, uh, watching all the footage and plan how to edit it in, in a way that we will it, it will be useful for uh, uh, custodians activating the work in the future um, and archiving the footage as well. Uh, and all this information then needs to be organized within our conservation tools. This this takes a very long time, and obviously, it's important to say that we are not I'm, we are not just working on this case. We have many other projects going on at the same time. Next slide, please. Um, so, uh, when I talk about conservation tools, uh, this is the case uh, of the activation report, which is an author document that documents a single moment on an artwork's life. Uh, in this case, this report um, will only document a single activation of our labyrinth in the Turbine Hall uh, Tate Modern in 2022. Uh, and for instance, is where we track um, uh, instances like, uh, in this case, there were two uh, performance, performers uh, uh, performing at, uh, at once instead of just one as originally part of the work. And uh, um, such a report has different sections that act as prompt questions uh, so that we know what kind of information we want to record as part of, of an activation. And these sections um, can be sections such as um, describing uh, stakeholders involved, uh, if there were any conditions placed on the activation of the work, space details, physical components, um, the documentation that was developed, and um, the author's reflection or a statement about uh, the work that was developed. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here you can see just an example uh, of a storyboard that we developed. Uh, and how we are thinking of editing the footage that we recorded during the activation of the work. And this keeps us, um, uh, you know, because the work develops for such a long time, keeps us on track and uh, focused on um, and focused as well. Um, next slide, please, Fran. Um, so now I'm, I'm repeating this slide because I just wanted to get back to the beginning again. 
Um, so the knowledge shared or the understanding, understanding generated during an activation, such as uh, the understanding developed through observation and interviews, produces an activation report, but equally feeds back into the performance specification, which is also um, another author document that aims to provide all the necessary elements to activate the performance in the future. So it kind of, this is a, a documentation cycle almost, uh, where, you know, you, you, you have, uh, you produce a lot of documentation um, in a specific activation that is a specific moment of the work, but this can also go back uh, into um, into the the information that is needed to uh, activate the work uh, in the future and 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 keep you know adding layers of understanding to it. And I just uh, lastly just wanted to to share some lessons learned or some reflections that we we developed through this uh, this activation this experience. So during the three weeks of performances at Tech Modern, there was time to discuss the documentation with the artist and his studio, as they were always present. And, you know, we had chats uh, that were very easy and informal. This ended up contributing to influence the development of the documentation according and hopefully with better outcomes for the preservation of the work and, and also for the artist. Equally, it was apparent that conservators need to be around beyond the time dedicated during rehearsals for documentation. The performance is a process that happens beyond the performing space in the gallery. Checking in with performers, artists, the studio was paramount to get better understanding on how things are dealt with on a daily basis while the performance is taking place. This is crucial to get a sense of how things evolve and how the work shapes through the activation. And part of our documentation work is to acknowledge that we won't be able to document everything, especially when dealing with artworks which include improvisation practices. This was something that we have also seen for Tony Conrad's 10 years alive on the infinite plane. Documentation from a conservation lens will not be enough in translating the different performers' uh, experience to transmit this type of works and preserve them in the long term. Uh, there is a human or a relational element we can never um, can never be replaced by documents. Uh, given this, I believe that a huge part of our job here is identifying and supporting the communities around these works in transmitting them. Part of this may be done via documentation, but not all. So the unknown plays a part and, and, and that is okay also. Um, and I guess that in terms of performance art, we are at the stage that there is a lot of trial and error with documentation for, for these kinds of words. We're testing methods and adapting them as, as, we, as we go, as we learn. And, um, and yeah, I would like now to uh, pass over to my colleague, uh, Francesca. And Hello. Um, yeah, Anna, I think Sorry, just... No, yeah. you don't need to share right oh, away. Oh, no. Sorry. Presentation, but that's okay. Whatever. Um, okay. So, uh, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, to echo what Patricia and Anna said, like, I really would like to thank you also, Osman, for inviting us. Um, I was saying that earlier, but it's it's actually a great moment to reflect on, on the practice after having written uh, the book chapter. So my name is Francesca and Osman already did a pre um, presented us, but uh, I just wanted to add that I specifically work as a conservator with displays and exhibitions. Um, and I started at Tate as a time-based media technician seven years ago. So that's kind of like my angle. I do not have a conservation degree. Um, I went to art school. So there is also a big mix of like the technical fascination, art practice that I feel like I can bring and does influence my approach to time-based media conservation. Um, so my main contribution to the book chapter co-written with Anna and Patricia is um, about documenting the specific moment when an artwork gets displayed. 
So when it materializes in the galleries. And today I decided to present you an approach to documentation through a personal experience that um, for me was particularly significant and collaborative. And this was the 2020 Steve McQueen exhibition at Tate Modern. So before I start talking about this experience, um, I would like to point out that I won't share with you any specific images of Steve McQueen's artworks, nor any of the documentation we created. And this is also something that we touched in the book chapter, um, how difficult it is sometimes to share this type of documents. Um, and I do it mainly as a form of respect towards the long-standing trust that we built with the artist and with his team during a full year of working together in shaping the exhibition. Um, so if you want to have a peek, I can drop a link in the chat to a New York Times review of the exhibition. So let me see if I, should I, I'll just do it in the Q&A. No, can I? I can do it later maybe, because I don't know how to do it now. <laughs> but, um, so yeah, so Anna, if you wanna share, I've got a few slides, although I don't have images. So um, as I mentioned before, uh, I had the luxury of having a lot of time to work in shaping and documenting this exhibition. And I also want to highlight this because it is a pretty exceptional condition to have time and resources, because we often are pulled in many directions as Anna was saying earlier. So, um, and also from the conservation side, I was definitely not alone. So I worked along, um, alongside my colleagues, Rob Kennedy, Yulia Kalinichenko and Claire Perro, who were the core conservation technician behind this project. But during the installation, it was literally like all hands on deck. So I do need to thank the old business media conservation team for also jumping in in a project where they didn't necessarily, where they were not planning to actually be part of. Um, and of course, we worked with the various teams involved internally and externally the museum, since uh, it was the first major survey exhibition of Steve McQueen in the UK. So it, it was a massive um, uh, collective effort. So Anna, if you wanna go to the next slide. So um, the exhibition, um, included a large number of time based media artworks, so 13, um, and a mix of collection works, um, the one that I have highlighted in blue, and loaned in artworks, so the ones in, um, in black. Um, so it, it was ranging from like single channel video projections, like static, illuminar, and credits, uh, and Girls Tricky, um, which is actually a a proper, I mean, all of them are installations. Uh, I do consider them video installations, um, but it's the girls tricky, for example, it's a very specific environment. It's a soundproof room with like specific materials and it looks like a recording studio, very boomy, um, like enveloping soundtrack. And then we had multi-channel video works like Ashes, Once Upon a Time, which is actually, it was actually like a sort of software um, based light show. Then we showed uh, Western Deep in a room that was built like a cinema. So with bespoke uh, seating designed by Steve and his collaborators. Uh, there was like multiple channels of sound and a seven meter wide projection. There were works in 60 millimeter film and like, uh, like Charlotte and Cold Breath. And then um, 7 of November, which is an analog 35 millimeters projection. So yeah, um, you can have an idea of the complexity and variety of carriers and media. Um, so that this was a challenge. And although I said we do not normally document thoroughly loaned artworks, in this case, in agreement with Steve's gallery, and his longtime collaborator, Sue McDermott, we decided to document everything. The main reason um, being the general necessity to create a more solid catalog of Steve's practice, because um, Steve doesn't have a studio. 
And subsequently, uh, the fact that we had to close the exhibition after less than a month due to COVID. So um, I think that interestingly, this sense of um, loss and sort of unknown, I would say, yeah, unknown and loss, sentimental loss for me particularly, contributed to us working more in detail on the documentation. So to put way more effort um, than normal, I would say. Um, in the book chapter, um, and if we can go to the next slide, Anna. So I divided um, the phases of documenting a display slash exhibition in four parts um, that I will dissect by using the example of Steve McQueen work. So I think the first phase is, um, I like to call it building the foundation. So reviewing previous documentation. So we knew that the work proposed for display were 13. Some of them were collection works, so we had some information on them. But again, a lot of this collection work, maybe they hadn't been shown for a very long time. So there was a gap in documentation. And so the necessity um, to, to be in conversation with the gallery, with Steve's team, to, um, and research on, on the history of display was, was real. So in this phase, the, the sort of documentation that I, I sort of developed was a roadmap uh, into like um, tracing down like the previous equipment that had been used, um, the media, because the media was a real pinch point of our work in terms of like having different masters, like really clarifying what were the masters um, because some of the work had been remastered, some of the work, um, you know, Steve decided to, to, in the past, to show either one or another media. So yeah, so really like reviewing everything that has happened in the past and trying to have a knowledge and a sense of the artwork, which feeds into the second phase, which is documenting the preparation of the artworks for display. So I think when there is like a solid foundation, um, which is already a stage where, you build collaboration in, in doing this detective work, then uh, the preparation of the artworks for display. And mm, maybe it's worth explaining that having conservation technicians in the team also means that most of this preparation is done on site. Uh, so we, we do it in collaboration with, with the gallery and with the artist team. So. Um, and this was a very, very important and specific exhibition where a lot of the equipment used um, had been tested multiple times because of the specificity of the installations that we were doing. So um, again, like I like to think of this phase of the documentation as a sort of um, dumping ground <laughs> in the sense that we do have our artwork folders, but in this space, I sort of like dump everything, like from information on like all the testing sessions on, uh, I don't know, like, like what we're doing to create exhibition file formats. Um, all of this just gets sort of quickly get dumped and then reorganized in um, an installation or like a report that Anna was mentioning before, because we do installation reports. And then the installation phase. So in this case, um, we had two weeks to install the exhibition. It was an incredibly tight time. Uh, for me, it never really works uh, to document very much during the installation. So again, I dump everything I can and then everything gets um, like tidy up in an installation report where we include um, wiring diagram and I've got an example in the next slide. So this is an example of a wiring diagram which gets um, inserted in the installation report and for me I, I chose this example because for me this is like a particularly important one. I, I love to look at wiring diagrams because I think they give a lot of information so even there, if there is no time to to actually do it using images it, I think it's worth doing even just by sketching on a piece of paper, like what a kind of connections and equipment had been used. And then if we can go back. So in this installation report, we put metadata, we put, 
you know, opinions, decisions that have been made in the gallery, every detail of like, you know, projection fabric, equipment, um, dynamics of like, I don't know, like of decision-making, we put it in there. And then we also document um, the post installation, the care and the maintenance, because when the exhibition is on, then, you know, we do need to do maintenance. And this is a great way to sort of monitor how the artworks behave a little bit, again, like Anna mentioned with performance. So if we can get to the next and um, final, the next thing. Um, so I just want to conclude saying that, um, as I mentioned before, the exhibition closed because of COVID, then it reopened again for a short period of time. And we worked very collaboratively in the documentation. So during lockdown, um, we were using Google Docs because this was an easy way for everyone to work on collaborative documents. Um, and so to feed in and documentation. And then when the exhibition was about to close, I did a spreadsheet um, to sort of like trace um, details on what kind of information we needed to capture when back in the galleries because like we could only briefly access the gallery we couldn't spend a lot of time in there so as you can see from here like I I wrote down who were the main people involved in the install and then if we could have done um, some of the documentation work remotely or on site so wiring diagrams screen fabric uh, details of like hanging systems that we use and like details of screen constructions, all of this, it was very important to know like if we were missing information because there were huge gaps between like lockdown and it was strange times. So yeah, that's, that's my uh, experience. And I just wanted to conclude that with to echo what Anna was saying, what I take back from this uh, is actually the relationships, how by having time working all together in this, it, it, it was just incredible. Like we started trusting each other and like information were flowing and having all these people feeding in the documentation was, was really something very unique. And, but there is also a part that is the unknown that cannot get documented, which is all of this special kind of relationship that we created in, in putting together this exhibition. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. I'll pass on to Patricia. Hello again. I'm just going to share my screen. <clears throat> Sorry, didn't mean to do that. Um, doo -doo -doo. There we are. So now it's gone too far. So I'm talking about the artwork that you're seeing here, which is souls. And I I was trying to find a what to call it, and I guess the most explanatory medium line you could use maybe is like a software-based sculpture, which is probably completely wrong, but, um, and, and this is a, um, a work from 1997 by a British artist called uh, Donald Rodney. Uh, I find it particularly touching because what, I'll show you the, the work in a minute running, um, but to say that uh, Donald Rodney was a black artist with very serious health issues in the 90s, so much so that he, he passed away if, he, a couple of years later. And so the wheelchair for him was sort of almost part of him, I guess. It's, so it's a really important element is, is this strong presence of the wheelchair in the gallery. And so I'll start by showing you the work running. Um, and this work was a collaboration between Donald Rodney um, and the University of Plymouth, both a computer scientist called uh, 
Guido Bookman that developed the software that you can see on the laptop at the back. And this was, you know, this is a very early form of AI that Professor Bugman de developed. Um, it was something that interested him and the limit had this history of robotics. And so he felt this was a really interesting project to work on. So he contributed a big part of, of the uh, software development. Uh, and he worked closely with Professor Mike Phillips to develop and, and students from Plymouth to take care of, to, to develop the electronics behind it. And I'm not going to go into the detail of that because it's fairly complex, but uh, what is happening is, um, so this, you can see the little sensors on the chair with the little circles, and those are solar sensors and they provide location information to the software that then calculates the, the movement of the chair and sends that information to um, um, a rug warrior, which is a, another piece of electronics that then directs the chair to move in the space. Um, and there is a, a shape that is made, but if there's anything that sensors uh, see, then it, the, the movement changes. And so the idea is that the people people are in the space with the chair and you know the chair just moves and, and avoids people and stops if there's someone ahead of it. So it's almost like a living being. Now for us this was quite I mean for me at least when I started looking at it, it was pretty scary. This this has become now the, the work with the oldest technology in the collection. Um it has really strong hardware dependencies. So it, often you say, okay, we can run the software in a virtual machine and it will work fine. And there's, you know, there's not much we need. I mean, we, we always worry about it, but we don't have to worry too much about it. Um, right. But it, it, you know, this one is a bit special like that. It's also the only one I can think of that is that, um, sculptural and there is this entanglement between the software and the hardware and the wheelchair. And also the, all the hardware is really visually important. It looks, if you look in the detail, I'll, I'll show you a picture later of, if you look in the detail at the electronics, it looks pretty messy, but that is how, um, you know, how it was created and that's important part of it. Uh, we were really lucky because even though uh, Donald Rodney is not there, um, the estate and I, so Diane Simmons who's, uh, was his partner um, and a group of friends um, that called themselves Don, Donald Rodney PLC because throughout Donald Rodney's life, they contributed a lot to their works. Uh, so Keith Piper and Mike Phillips are the other people that we engage with right from the beginning. They were really keen to help and, and uh, provide information and, and um, passing on to us their experience. The same can be said of the University of Plymouth. And, and um, in this case, uh, Mike Phillips, who's um, also a teacher at the University of Plymouth, has been the caretaker for of this piece since 97. So the, the chair, the wheelchair and um, I mean, the work has been living in the University of Plymouth and they've done a great job of maintaining it over time, displaying it in multiple situations. And they created an incredible amount of documentation about it. Um, if you looked in the first slide, there was a link for IDAT. And if you are interested, um, there's a lot of documentation that was created by uh, the team in Plymouth uh, about the piece. So we were quite lucky in that there's so many, so much information available. Um, and in fact, we also have Donald Rodney's archive at Tate, which is, well, at Tate Archive. So that was pretty, it's also very helpful to learn about the work and understand the artist's work when considering the treatments in the future. Uh, you know, further to that, from the Tate side, we ha we have we had a few curators involved. They changed over time, um, but they've been really engaged and supportive of the conversations with the estate. Um, and then we, because there is this cultural element, I've and, and along with the software and the hardware, I've been working with Tom Hansom, uh, who is a freelancer with us that has now 
a lot of experience in software-based artworks, um, but also from the cos sculpture conservation part. We've worked with Melanie Rolf, who's a conservator in the Melza Watts, who is a senior tech as well. Um, and they've been doing a great job around, you know, how to preserve something that is meant to move around in the gallery and where people might want to sit on, which you probably don't want them to do. Um, <coughs> so it, it raises a, a series of other questions. Also, the wheels will deflate or, or, or the rubber will fail and um, Melanie and them also will look into that, which is very reassuring for me. Um, and then we've been very lucky because we could hire Paul Klomp and Bill Costello to work with us. Um, and Paul is a brilliant uh, artist and technologist that has worked in preservation for a long time, also with Lima. Um, and he brought a wealth of, exper you know, of experience around electronics that really made it much easier to have the translation between um, you know, um, what Guido talks about and what I understand. I do often use some translation and Paul is brilliant at doing that. And Bill Castello uh, has been working more on the motor side of things, but also, uh, but also how that overlap between uh, sculpt, um, sorry, the sculptural elements, the electronics and the motors is quite, we try to be as clear as possible about that. And so you can see that there's a, a big team of people involved, not to mention, uh, you know, registrars that ship the, that ship the object and um, and so on. So, and the interesting thing um, is, so what was really helpful was we had a week um, at Tate Stores, and that's what you can see here. Not very well. I'm sorry. I put the text on top, and probably shouldn't have was we were able to use a space that takes stores where you have, where we could bring the people together um, and look at the, the, the wheelchair and at the work and at the technologies and, and together and understand uh, what was going on and ask questions to everybody um, and just have what Francesca was talking about, about the the mood and the trust that is built, that is again a situation where it is really worth having people over and, and just spending the time to do that, which we needed. Um, unfortunately, I managed to have COVID that week. So Tom Hansen is now the owner of the information, <laughs> but you know, I think it was good for them. And it, it, there's some good documentation left over, including the pictures that you are seeing. Uh, so I'm gonna move on from the people and just talk briefly. So this is the software and it was clearly from the beginning because you have the laptop on the back of the chair that is was important. And the more you learn about how it was developed and the scientific significance of it, which most of our other works that have software don't have this element. So it was clear that we wanted to preserve it. There might be the possibility of using a completely different, much more, much simpler software to create the same effect of the chair moving and avoiding people, but that's not what we want to do. And that really influences how we can preserve the work and our options. Um, and then there's the, a lot of electronics. <coughs> and I believe the laptop you see is probably Guido's. I'm not sure in this case, but you can, you, if you look under the chair, it's, it's, it's not the tidiest, let's say it like that, but it is, it work, I mean, it has worked for, since 1997. Uh, okay, so I'll move on. And so what, what I feel is different for this piece um, is for one, it's true of every other artwork. We want to keep the original equipment for as long as possible, but this one has this extra aesthetic um, importance that make, make it feel um, harder to preserve almost. Uh, and so it, uh, it affects as well how we preserve the plan for preservation. Uh, but what we have done with the, the help of, of Guido and Mike uh, but also Paul 
was to assess the risks for each individual component. You know, how we, how frequent, you know, can we just buy it off eBay now? Is it something that is now completely obsolete? Do we need to, to you know, uh, take bits out of a leftover robot warrior that was still lying around in Guido Bugman's um, attic? Um, so that we could do that assessment. And that was a lot because of the experience of both Mike Phillips on how things were failing or not, um, but also Paul Plump's experience of that over time. So he was pretty, um, it was pretty clear for him what, what would be failing next. Um, and that also meant that by being able to assess that, we could figure out, okay, when this thing fails, then we we will have to change all of these other things. Um, and in this case, what you see is a detail on this slide, what you see is a detail of the connection to the computer. And that is a pretty unique con connection. And as far as I know, Tom was trying to find a, another um, model with the same connector and he hadn't been able to find it. I mean, it is from 1997, so it's no surprise there. But we sort of know that the next, if the computer fails, which is going to happen anytime at some point, um, we will need to rethink this connection and then how that impacts the rest of the electronics. <laughs> the other thing that has become very clear with this process and because of its complexity is how, so we are learning from Guido and Mike, but we're also learning a lot from Paul and Bill. Um, and but it is it it often needs some degree of translating. So it's it's making that information understandable with all its implications to a lay person like myself, which is um, yeah. So it is it, in this translation is quite important, and I think how we then capture the detail, but also balance that out with, with having the overview of the piece and the implications of each one of, of those details is something that we are still working on and at risk of creating a big pile of work for ourselves. <laughs> um, and I think this is what I was going to say. So I'll just finish with the conclusions and then we'll have our questions. And I think, Fran and Anna, if you want to jump in on this one, I think we are okay for time. So just go ahead. Um, the one thing, so first I wanted to repeat, these are very complex examples that we documented in very privileged situations. So it's not like we can do this every time. Although for very complex things we must, and we've become very good at planning for it, uh, but it's also a little bit, you also need to be able to make the case for that. And one of the cases is that the documentation is not just about the end result and having the report or the document, but it's also this learning process um, that, um, you know, Tom and I have had by participating in the discussions and hearing uh, well, in Tom's case, being there and working with Guido and, and Paul, um, but also then the communication with the state and building that and learning uh, about that history of the work. Um, we're also thinking about consistency on documentation. So I, I'm, I feel pretty free about if we have different artworks, they need different levels of of um, documentation and it's okay if for a work all you need is three pages great <laughs> um, but if you do need a big um, report about something then that's you just need to make the time for that <laughs> but also I feel that we need to we, we also think critically about documentation and and often it's sort of it's doing something and then figure out okay what is needed how do we make it usable for the future? If you have a massive report and you don't know what you need, or if you have multiple reports and then the information is not very clear, which is often the case so that you have to go through the whole documentation available. Um, 
yeah, that's something maybe we could try. We, we, we are trying to improve, I think. Um, and then the final point is that in, you know, documentation is essential. We do need to do it, uh, but often it's, it's, but to do that, you do need to advocate for the time and resources as that's not necessarily part of our day-to-day -day program. Um, so I think both Anna and Fran made this point very clearly that it's, yeah, you need to explain to a curator why you need to spend, you know, three days or five days in the gallery rather than the three that is being planned or, <coughs> or justified to our facilities manager why we do need the whole week at um, N-Store uh, to be able to play with our, um, with forms um, instead of being pho photographing artworks in the collection. So with that, I finish.